Welcome. Bonjour. Bienvenue. It's wonderful to have you here at uh, Massey College, so welcome to you all. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College, so it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yonwanda, the Seneca, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we want to uh, recognize our duty of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we have to be here together. To discuss a great book, <laughs> uh, Systemic Islamophobia in Canada, a research agenda, and I'm delighted that senior fellows Anne Bariemon has agreed to launch this book here. I'm particularly happy to do that because this is, uh, throughout my career, I'm a legal professional by, by training, uh, I, and I was heading the Canadian Civil Liberties Association at some point where we did many of the some of work and I recognize in the book many of the people that I read or that I cooperated with. So I can vouch that there are actually great uh, insights in this book for sure. And to lead us in this discussion, I think we're uh, so honored uh, to have uh, with us Amira El Gawabi. Uh, she's a journalist, a human rights advocate. Uh, she, as you know, has recently been appointed Canada's special representative on combating Islamophobia. I knew Amira from her previous lives as well, where she uh, certainly we've read her as she was a contributing columnist at the Toronto Star and a frequent uh, media commentator on equity and inclusion. Uh, she was the strategic communications and campaigns uh, person at the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. She worked as well uh, to the, uh, the National Council of Canadian Muslim, where I knew her as she went in, in that position. And also, she has an extensive career in uh, being involved in an initiative to, to support counter hate and to promote inclusion. She was a past founding board member of the Canadian T Hate Network and a past board member of the Silk Road Institute. She served two terms as a commissioner on the Public Policy Forum Canadian Commission on Democratic Expressions, where we had the occasion to work together, and she currently sits on the National Security Tra Transparency Advisory Group. She was a writer in residence, this I did not know, she was a writer in residence at the 2019 Literary Arts Residency at the BAM Center for Arts and Creativity, and her 2019 TEDx Ottawa talk is a title Multiculturalism Worth Defending. She has an honors degree in journalism and law from Carleton University in Ottawa. Welcome, merci beaucoup d'être ici. It's wonderful, thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Natalie. It's so good to, to be here again in, in familiar ground. Um, and very honored uh, to be here on uh, the traditional territory of many nations, uh, including the Sasagas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. So very honored to be here and to be participating uh, today in this important event to launch the book Systemic Islamophobia in Canada, a research agenda, which I just got a copy of in my hand as a hard copy. Super excited. I've had a chance, of course, to to skim through the digital copy that I had in preparation for today, but can't wait to, to really dig in, um, as I'm sure everyone uh, online and in person today uh, will be thinking about. Um, it's very, very meaningful for me uh, to start thinking about these issues at, at the systemic level, because of course, as was just mentioned, um, in my new role as Special Representative on Combating Islamophobia, uh, the mandate that I have been entrusted with um, really will be about addressing uh, these broad issues. Um, and among my mandate uh, includes providing guidance and advice to support the Government of Canada's efforts to combat Islamophobia in Canada, and providing advice to inform the development of policies, legislative proposals, programs, and regulations that could affect Muslim Canadians. So. That's, you know, those are some of the bullets of my mandate. Um, but as I've, I've been sharing with folks, as I'm putting, putting together um, the priorities for the office, um, these, are, these are long standing issues that have been impacting our communities in so many different ways. And it really will take uh, a community 
right across Canada of allies as well as our own communities who've been working and thinking about these issues to start to really make meaningful change. And so I'm very excited. I'm very excited to be in a room here uh, with folks who have been thinking about these issues and dealing with it in different sectors across society. Um, and I'm here to indeed be a champion for the work that people have already undertaken and that will continue to undertake as we go forward. So this body of work in particular will be extremely useful to the efforts of the office and I'm sure will be very helpful for those in government to hear about and learn from as well. For now, uh, we are extremely privileged to be able to have a discussion with the book's editors and several of the authors, and there are many of the authors also here in the room as well, which I hope to uh, hear from. Uh, now let me introduce, though, this esteemed group on stage with me, um, and please note that I have edited their bio biographies considerably uh, because uh, very impressive and extensive biographies. So I really do encourage you to learn more about the speakers here because I won't be able to list all their achievements. They're, they're that long. Um, but to begin, um, so Anver Iman is known to many of you. He's a professor of law and history in the Faculty of Law and, Dep and the Department of History at the University of Toronto. He holds the Canada Research Chair on Islamic Law and History and directs the Institute of Islamic Studies. He is an editor of the volume. Also an editor on this book, uh, Atiyah Hussain's research is guided by a fundamental interest in how race constitutes immaterial reality and is an organizing principle in European colonial structures of thought. And Dr. Hussain's current stream of research is about race and terrorism. And Professor Rabat Rabiat Akande works in the fields of legal history, law and religion, constitutional and comparative constitutional law, Islamic law, international law, and post-colonial African law and society. Her current research ex explores struggles over religion-state relations in comparative contexts and illuminates law's centrality to one of modernity's most contested issues, the relationship between religion and the state and society while also interrogating law's complex relationship with power, political theology, identity, and sociopolitical change. And finally, Kent Roach is professor of law at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. In 2015, he was appointed a member of the Order of Canada. In 2016, named with Craig Forsese as one of the top 25 influential lawyers in Canada in the change maker category by a Canadian lawyer. He was awarded the Molson Prize for the Social Sciences and Humanities in 2017. And his next book, Wrongfully Convicted, Gil uh, wrongfully convicted um, is set to be released. So I want to just take a moment to welcome everyone, if we can give them a round of applause for, for being here. So the way that it will work is we'll hear just a few opening remarks about what they wrote about in this book, um, why they chose the topic they did, and then we'll go with a Q&A with myself and then open it up to the, to the audience, as well as those who are joining us online will also have a chance to ask questions. So I'll start with you, uh, Professor Iman. Uh, tell us about what you've written about, why you've put this book together, what you hope comes from it. Well, thank you very much. So I want to first begin uh, <laughs> by thanking a number of people. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is an edited collection which means it took a family of people together. Um, and so obviously, Robbie, it's been a pleasure working with you. Kent, uh, you've been a long-standing colleague and friend. I have others uh, from the law school here who've uh, advised me along the way. I saw David Schneiderman come in earlier. Um, but there's also many of the authors in the book are here, and I wanna take a moment and ask them to stand. <laughs> They're all here. So we have, uh, Yusuf Sufi, Nassim Mithawani, Wafa Hassan, Zainab uh, Faruqi, and then just walking in was Faisal Baba, who has a chapter in these books. So my hope is that the, the audience here will have a chance to connect with them. They have some really important things to say on a wide range of issues. Um, was really also grateful for support from our university students, very talented individuals who helped. So I think, I know Maham is here. Maham, where are you? Maham, uh, as a very talented undergraduate, helped support the editing of the book along the way, and so I want to thank her. And of course, the University of Toronto Press, uh, who's outside with copies of the book, and I hope you'll uh, feel free to pursue that. And, and lastly, just want to make a little bit of note. Um, I'm not a specialist in, Islam in Islamophobia. I'm not really a modernist. I'm trained as a medievalist. But it's because of my kids that I care about this topic, and they're actually here today. So I'm grateful that both of them are here, and uh, I won't embarrass them more than that uh, as a dad, but I do appreciate them being here. So how did we start this book? 
The book started as an idea that came out of the summit on Islamophobia in 2021. Some of the concerns that came out of that summit that we, we didn't really address systemic issues and um, you know how do we identify them, where do we locate them. Um, I was fortunate to have written the piece in anticipation of that or prior to that summit on the CRA and its audits of Muslim-led charities. And the concern that I had was we're not looking for people in the government that are outright racist or Islamophobic. These are policies built upon policies, built upon policies that while facially neutral get applied in ways that have discriminatory impact or effect. Um, no one's going out of their way. I mean, in many ways, it's not like, oh, look at the races here or there. No, it, that's not the nature of this kind of project. It's how do you think systemically? And that's a much more careful analysis, sometimes meticulous to the point of being pedantic. But what everyone in this, in this book has done is shown that if you're going to undertake this kind of research, one, the, the range is wide, and the kind of analysis that has to be done is very careful, is very meticulous, but oftentimes in the context of sources that you have to be very creative about in locating, because they're not obvious. And so the idea behind this book is how do we tackle those sorts of areas? None of the essays here offer solutions. None of the essays are even full, address, uh, full, full efforts at addressing the situation. They're gestures to areas and, and, and fields of inquiry that require further research. So if anything, the reason it's called a research agenda is because we think that this is for future generations to undertake. We are, um, I certainly am getting older, so I don't know if this is something that I'll undertake. Kent, how are, I, I don't know, he's got a, he's, he's got a, He's got, a, he's got a few more books in him. Uh, and so you know, the idea then is to really facilitate a conversation that inspires a new generation of researchers. I'd like to just spend a few moments to talk a little bit about the piece that I wrote on moving Muslim money. And what is that about? Moving Muslim money is really uh, a piece that came out of my, uh, my analysis of the CRA. And I was really concerned about people's bank accounts. What happens when banks get suspicious, they're subject to a variety of legislative requirements around anti-terrorism financing. What happens to someone who, though not subject to criminal sanction, nonetheless raises concerns for a bank? And so I began looking at, well, there is legislation, the Proceeds of Crime Act. The Proceeds of Crime Act was amended in 2001 after 9-11 to add to money laundering the element of terrorism financing. But it began to be troubling to me, how exactly do you locate terrorism financing? What exactly is a terrorist? What does it mean to finance them? And how does money get marked in that way? And um, just as I was concerned about the Finance Canada's risk-based assessment model, I too was concerned about how do we identify risk? We know that if you spend $10,000 and send it overseas or anywhere, that gets marked on a suspicious transaction record subject to section seven of, um, or one of the sections of the, of the Proceeds of Crime Act. We know that transactions to some places seem to be more troublesome than others. Um, but how do we address this? And the fact of the matter is we don't know. We know that FinTrack, which oversees this particular regime, is not required to disclose its findings. It's not required to disclose suspicious transaction reports. It does periodic reviews of banks for their compliance mechanisms. We know third-party software vendors create compliance mechanisms, but we don't know what those compliance mechanisms look like. National security, intellectual property, all protect them from disclosure. And so ultimately we have an, a financial system that's been conscripted into the war on terror with very little democratic oversight. And the concern in moving Muslim money is, how do we begin thinking about researching in this area? How do we open up or look underneath the covers of FinTrack when the covers are stapled down? And that's the core idea around my essay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there and I'll turn it over to Rabiat. That's all right. Yeah, no, thanks so much for that, uh, Professor Iman. Yes, uh, Dr. Rabiat, tell us a bit about your essay, why you chose to, sh to share the thoughts that you did. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Maria for that um, kind introduction and, and thanks um, Ava for inviting me to um, join the project. As I recall, I was still a newbie to the Canadian Academy and in fact still working remotely from Boston when I got the invitation to write the chapter. And it's a real honor to be um, a part of um, all of this. 
Um, the chapter that I contribute um, really um, tries to grapple with what it might mean to, um, to think about intersectionalizing the study of Islamophobia in the Canadian context. Um, you know, it, it really um, you know, calls for an attunement to um, the question of intra-group vulnerability. Um, and as the title um, suggests, for those who have had the chance to um, look at the table of contents, um, Centering the Black Muslima, I do focus on um, the axis of gender um, and race, and specifically the question of anti-black racism. Um, but really that frame um, can be um, adapted to study um, other forms of axis um, of intra-group um, um, oppression within the Muslim community. Um, and, and I, um, you know, I, I, I make a case for, um, by the idea that devoting scholarly energies uh, to and, um, and focusing scholarly efforts um, to understanding um, this question of intra-group vulnerability um, and to remedying um, those forms of oppression really would ultimately um, advance and not undermine the overall work of, um, of, of anti-Islamophobia. Um, and I, I do want to um, point out, though, two further areas of um, you know, research that I think that this um, chapter just just towards and, um, and, and hope that that would be, um, you know, that invitation will be taken up by you and members of the audience as, as a source of back and forth between us. And the, the first is really to, um, to point out that the question of intergroup group vulnerability remains one that um, is live, um, you know, and one that is continues to be worthy of scholarly exploration, um, and that raises, um, you know, many questions that, to my mind, have not been sufficiently explored, um, you know, by scholars and have not received um, sufficient attention by, uh, you know, by activists um, and advocates. Uh, one of those uh, questions, and perhaps the most um, obvious one, um, is really that concerning the tension between um, our <coughs> commitment to the autonomy of the religious community as a whole, um, on the one hand, um, right, mm -hmm. and the need, right, um, you know, to um, to uphold, to uh, protect, to um, you know, to advance, um, you know, the, the rights of individual members of that community, and particularly vulnerable ones, right, as persons who be a charter rights um, and, and freedoms. And in fact, my colleague um, Faisal Baba, who is in the audience and one of the book's authors, um, and I just uh, grapple with this question in um, a piece that was just recently published in the Supreme Court Law Review, um, in which we you know, we, we point out that this question will remain live and, you know, um, and open for debate um, um, for years, maybe even decades to come, considering um, how scant the jurisprudence is on the question, um, and also considering um, just how keen the interest of religious communities, both the Muslim community, but also the religious communities in Canada um, um, is um, on this particular issue. The second um, um, area um, or sort of arena that um, I believe that this chapter um, right, opens up uh, is really to um, to ask um, you know us all you know as um, you know as scholars as you know as, as activists as you know as observers as people who are interested in the question of Islamophobia to um, to think and perhaps to rethink the interplay between Islamophobia and racism right so it's you know commonplace to hear that Islamophobia is racism um, but really the, the how and so what question remain largely unexplored. Um, and that, you know, those questions are not uh, merely um, rhetorical or even polemical as some would um, actually label them to be. They really matter in terms of understanding what Islamophobia is. They also really matter um, for, um, you know, imagining and or even designing effective policy responses to Islamophobia. Um, I, I also wanted to point out that these questions are not by any means limited to the Canadian debate or to legal and policy um, you know, discusses in Canada. Um, currently, that question is being um, hotly contested, um, even at the side of the United Nations, right, where one of the UN committees is considering um, the question um, of possibly extending international legal protections um, um, against racial discrimination to cases of religious discrimination. And I've been privileged to be a part of those talks myself. Um, and so that uh, question um, will, you know, will remain. It's, it's, it's one that continues to be um, a live discussion and one that I hope that scholars um, will, you know, will take off the invitation to engage in. I'm going to leave it there for now, and I really look forward to your comments, reactions, and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Akande. Uh, over to you, Professor Roach, uh, again, just to 
give us a sense of what it was that you put forward here and, and why you chose the topic you did. Sure. Um, well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my good friend, Anver, uh, who uh, asked me to think about these things. And we've had, you know, great conversations about these things. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, it's, it's been a little tough. I think we were in Singapore together. We went through uh, uh, battles to publish something about the Toronto 18 uh, trial. It does take uh, some degree of courage to write about uh, some of these things. And uh, I, I look at admiration of what he's done with this institute and the fact that it reaches out into the community, which is something I think this university uh, does uh, uh, too infrequently. And so I'd like to applaud you for, for, for that. Um, so, I mean, I had looked at some of these issues uh, through the national security lens, but when Anver uh, asked me, and it was really, uh, you know, he stressed, this is just a research uh, uh, agenda, right? This isn't uh, the final word. And so uh, I was also at the time writing a book about Canadian policing. And so it gave me an opportunity uh, to go back uh, and look at uh, what has been called this vicious circle of over-policing and under-protection. And so, uh, you know, uh, I've, I, I was familiar with that with respect to Indigenous people in Canada. I started teaching in 1989. Yes, I am that old. Uh, and it was that year uh, that uh, the next year, the Manitoba Aboriginal Justice Inquiry looked at uh, two episodes. One, uh, the murder uh, of a young Cree girl in the Paw, uh, a great deal of impunity for that violence. And the second, a fatal police encounter between an Indigenous leader in Winnipeg uh, and the police. And so applying that theory, uh, uh, to intersecting groups, uh, including Canada's diverse Muslim population, uh, was really the thrust of my essay and what I ask other people to explore. Because uh, we know, I think, that it happens. And what I was really struck is how many intersecting groups. So this thesis, I think there is some evidence that it applies uh, to uh, um, uh, indigenous, black, uh, Muslim women. Uh, um, you know, 50% of our federal prison population is indigenous women. Uh, uh, but we also have missing and murdered indigenous women. Uh, and so how do you kind of uh, 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 square those things? Uh, also another intersecting group is black people. Uh, so black people are over-policed. There is driving while black, uh, racial profiling, um, and you know a lot of initial resistance. Uh, you know uh, when you get to be as old as me, you'll recall. I mean today the Supreme Court says, you know, if you have a racial profiling claim, go ahead, go for it. Uh, it's still very hard to prove, but it used to be that judges would get pretty mad at people that even talked. Uh, about that as a possibility. Uh, and then, uh, uh, um, then we come uh, to the Muslim uh, population, which is very diverse and obviously includes women and includes uh, uh, black uh, people. But um, you know, having spent a lot of time on national security counterterrorism law, uh, I got uh, the over-policing, the over-intelligence. Uh, you know, one of the highlights of my career was working for two years uh, with Justice O'Connor on the commission uh, that looked at the activities of Canadian officials in relationship to Mayor Arar and his wife, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking recently now that we have all these leaks uh, coming out of CSIS. If you go back and read Justice O'Connor's report,
report, you'll see that he was very critical of these uh, hyper, uh, 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 hypocritical leaks coming from the intelligence community that were used to uh, tar uh, Mr. Arar. Uh, and of course, nobody was ever prosecuted for those, although uh, Justice O'Connor said that they should be fully investigated. So again, you have this kind of combination of both being over-policed and under-protected. And of course, the horrors of Quebec City and Christchurch uh, have uh, underlined this as well as the increase of hate crime. And, you know, frankly, the fact that um, you know, on my readings of the press in Toronto, some things that should be recognized as hate crimes, some things that should be recognized as attacks on uh, mosques and the Muslim community are not necessarily being presented that way. So that kind of social construction. So there are no answers uh, 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 in my chapter, uh, but it is, I think, uh, an invitation uh, to uh, explore this topic and also to link it uh, with the treatments of other people in Canada. That there is this kind of myth of Canadian exceptionalism uh, that I increasingly spend uh, my waning years r railing against. And uh, I think by making the link to these, in some cases, different and in some cases, intersecting groups, uh, um, researchers can offer benefits uh, both to uh, Canada's diverse Muslim community as well as uh, to all of us uh, so that uh, hopefully we can move in the direction of making this uh, society uh, better. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Roach. And uh, Dr. Hussain has joined us now and, and is an editor on this, uh, this volume of work. Uh, would you share with us uh, what, you know, what brought you to work with uh, Professor Iman on this? Why, why did you decide to, to put your time and effort into looking at this collection? Yeah, um, so I just wanted to start by saying thank you to Anwar for including me on this panel, though I'm a series co-editor and not an author in this amazing volume. Um, so I started working as a co-editor on this series at um, Unver's Invitation, who, was really, who really thought up the idea for the series. So it's called Dimensions, Islam, Muslims, and Critical Thought. And the idea behind the series is to encourage works like this edited volume. Um, so part of the idea is to really develop the literature on Islam, Muslims, and Islamophobia, which I think of as distinct areas, in the Canadian context. So we seek to do this not in a nationalist, Canadian nationalist sort of a way but rather by taking the geographic, legal, political specificity of the Canadian context seriously. So we're thinking about empirically rich topics um, and not just you know, thinking about new directions in terms of new topics in these areas, but new approaches or rather really solid approaches like you see proposed in this edited volume. So emphasis on evidence, um, emphasis on the material, studying the state. One thing that the volume argues is that one of the challenges in studying the state is this problem of evidence. States are notoriously secretive, right? But this is a struggle that I think we have to really continue to have um, because the it, it is a truly fruitful one in the study of Islam, Muslims, and Islamophobia um, to develop our knowledge, not just of these groups and topics, but broader ones. Um, my great interest in this series is to think about Islam and Muslims as an empirical jumping point for exploring a wide range of issues. The scale and the scope of issues that we face right now are just so massive, ranging from problems of global capitalism, climate change, housing, employment, modernity, I mean, you name it. We, there's plenty that we need to work on. And so the great hope for this series is that it will think about Islam and Muslims 
as a way to get into these bigger issues. So toward, like Dr. Roach said, to help us all in the end. So I'll leave it there so we can get to our discussion. Thank you so much. Um, and there's, you know, we heard that there's not answers necessarily in, in these essays, um, that they are pointing towards areas of further thought and study. But that being said, certainly every author that's contributed a chapter um, has still grappled with at least bringing us a picture, a snapshot of the various ways that Islamophobia can be um, interrogated. And so one of the challenges that I, I know uh, I face in how we communicate around these issues um, is around how we describe systemic Islamophobia. And I'm gonna start with uh, Professor Iman on this one. So for instance, when people say, what, what do you mean when you say Islamophobia? Um, that, that it's on the rise. So fairly common practice is to say, well, look at the police reported hate crimes. You see, you can, that's a quantifiable number, 71% increase in hate crimes targeting Muslims from 2020 to 2021, something that people can wrap their heads around. But then when they start to ask for more concrete examples of the systemic forms of Islamophobia, um, you know, Professor Iman talked about sort of in the banking sector that he's looking at, but I would ask you, Professor Iman, you know, what would you say to the average person on the street um, on how systemic Islamophobia is showing up for Canadians? Well, that's a great question, um, and I, I can't, I'm not going to pretend to answer it fully, but, um, and there's a whole room of authors here who I think will have a different approach depending on how you structure your own analysis. So I am you know, both a historian and a law professor, so for me, those are the tools that I use to think about it from an evidentiary perspective. Uh, my view is that my interest is very much in interrogating the state. I do think that, you know, as, as um, Professor Hussein suggested at the, at the end of her remarks, is that the state does have the prerogative of secrecy. So the challenge for me as an academic is to say, if systemic Islamophobia is, um, is the kind of thing that's more often hidden or harder to locate, it's not because there's not, uh, there's not evidence. So we're, as, an acad as a academics, not necessarily being creative enough in thinking about how we capture it. And so, for instance, in my example around banking, I may never be able to get to the uh, algorithms or machine learning software that run a bank's compliance mechanism. But I can, for instance, study how compliance officers work. I can, uh, I can look at how they're trained. I can look at the kind of discursive practices between them and, um, and the larger international banking industry. And so those things, to the extent that they're available, they offer opportunities for us to pursue. But I also think, and this is one of the things that I learned when I was looking at the, the audits of Muslim charities, is that because it is hard and because the evidence isn't always there, we're oftentimes left with presenting evidence and having to let the reader make a decision. And oftentimes as an author, you want to be able to say, ha ha, here's the smoking gun, here's the evidence, and I can say the things conclusively. But bec precisely because Islamophobia operates in this ambiguous space, but also in a highly intersectional space. It's not always about Islam or Muslims, but maybe it's about a black Muslim in a specific context, or it's about driving while black while you're also wearing hijab. These are complicated scenarios that aren't always reducible to one or another factor. And oftentimes as academics, we also have to accept a certain degree of humility in what our evidence shows. And so what I've appreciated about both the, the authors in this book, but also the series in which it f fits is that an attention to evidence is what drives the analysis. And that's, been, that's, that's, my, that's my approach to thinking about how to locate where Islamophobia is systemically. And it's, and it's so important that you're, that you're able to do that work and, and provide that um, pointing towards the evidence, I think, and, and looking for it. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, doc, uh, Dr. Akande, if I may come to you now. You write in the essay, quote, um, if the body um, of the Muslim woman is constantly marked or othered, then that of the black Muslim woman is, even more uh, is an even more precarious intersection. Uh, certainly, we've heard, for instance, about targeted attacks against black Muslim women in parts of Canada and Alberta, for instance. Um, and so, just wanted to get you to share with, with us, um, how important is it 
for us to make sure that as we discuss Islamophobia, we are inclusive of these intersectional identities and how we try to confront the issue. Right. Um, thanks for that question. I, and I actually also have thoughts on the questions you asked of Professor Iman, and I, um, I'm going to try to um, wrap it into my response to your question. And, um, and I start by reflecting on how uncomfortable it was for me as a scholar to write this piece, because I am trained as a legal historian, and this piece did not, it's, it's not a it, was, it didn't come to me naturally. Um, it's not like I'm trained to, to look at evidence, to look um, at archives, to look at you know, historical pieces. And, and this, but this was just um, me speaking, um, you know, um, in a sense, um, obviously um, drawing from um, really mostly um, informal conversations that I've had um, you know, um, all through my life um, and that I didn't know would actually um, come out in a piece like this. And so this, this was really uncomfortable. And, and I, I say that because I wanna, um, I wanna respond to the point that has come up a couple of times about um, you know, um, evidence and, and how um, important that is in doing this work, um, both as scholars but also as, as advocates. Um, and I do wanna um, stress that it is so crucial that um, in thinking about the, the question of Islamophobia as scholars and in um, imagining what uh, an effective policy response might be, that we not only, um, you know, with the, that we don't obsess over, um, you know, what is quantifiable, like what we can see, like what we um, as, um, you know, as legal scholars, you know, I'm a law professor, you know, might think of as evidence and to really, um, to really listen to personal experiences, right? The sorts of experiences that are not um, that might not, um, you know, um, you know, um, be uh, you know, be presented as evidence in a courtroom, right? Um, that might not um, count as sort of um, hard evidence that I, as a legal historian, might want to look for, right, when I'm writing um, a book. Um, and, and that is so crucial. And I think that it's by listening um, and by looking um, and by really um, trying to include um, those sorts of, you know, those sorts of, you know, unmediated reflections. Um, and personal experiences that we can really hear what it means, right, to inhabit those intersectional axes that I talk about in this in this piece, but but also other forms of inter intersectional axes. So going beyond, um, you know, the gender and race uh, and the racial intersection, um, you know, and so you know to 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 understand um, um, what it means to inhabit that intersection, you know, and you know, and to grapple with that experience and to formulate. Um, an effective policy response really would call for going beyond um, hard evidence in the way in which we understand it as lawyers, even as legal historians. And this is, in a sense, an indictment on my own method, and this is why this piece is so challenging for me to write. Thank you for that. Um, and certainly, I, I think, when I reflect and learn from, from all of you, um, I, I hope that uh, in some of the work that I do with communities directly, to be able to bring those lived experiences back to um, government tables where, um, as many of us know, uh, the focus is often on show us the hard evidence, show us the numbers, show us the data, whereas, as you just pointed out, Professor Kande, you don't always have data in the way that we understand data, but we have um, the, the other types of storytelling that we need to be ensuring um, is shared uh, when we are trying to tackle these issues and, and sort of help um, protect and nurture the social fabric of, of Canada. Um, so I'll go over to Professor Roach. Um, you, in the chapter that you wrote, um, you talk about what you termed as a vicious cycle um, of over-policing and under-protection when it comes to marginalized groups. And that's where you're recommending the further research on how it relates to Muslims. But can you give us a little bit of an overview, and you, you did in your intro, but I'd like you to give you a bit more time, mm -hmm. of what we know to date around the over-policing and the over-protection of Muslim bodies. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, obviously uh, the Arar uh, Commission gave us a glimpse into how uh, stereotypes and misinformation and uh, a Canadian anxiety uh, to respond to American fears uh, resulted in uh, a, a, a human rights uh, tragedy, uh, Canadian complicity in rendition uh, to torture. And, uh, you know, that, that um, was a, 
I think a very important uh, point in time because that inquiry was appointed in 2004 uh, before a lot of the revelations about the extraordinary rendition program had become uh, public. So, you know, like my colleagues, I think approaching that uh, from a kind of legal history uh, sort of way. Um, when uh, Onver and I and, and others were doing work on the Toronto 18 uh, case, uh, you know, uh, there are issues about jury selection. Uh, the press was very uh, reluctant to report about the racial composition of the jury. Uh, so that's something that you know, maybe future historians talking to uh, 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 some of the Toronto 18 or their lawyers or other people that were in the courtroom uh, can uh, resuscitate. Where the vicious circle comes in, though, is this idea that feelings of mistrust as well as stereotypes then um, uh, um, make it more difficult for vulnerable groups uh, to receive equal protection from the state. Uh, this used to be called under policing, but I deliberately call it under protection because I think one of the things that we see is uh, that the police and intelligence, which are still in some ways not targeting uh, far right extremists, right? I mean, one reading wasn't necessarily Justice Rouleau's reading, but one reading of CSIS's, uh, you know, it wasn't a threat to security of Canada, was that CSIS still, despite their protestations, uh, have not recognized far-right extremism as a more deadly, or as, as Canada's most deadly uh, 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 threat of, uh, of, uh, of terrorism. So this combination of stereotyping Right, I, 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 I know what a terrorist looks like and it looks like what I think a Muslim looks like. Uh, but then also the fear uh, and the reasonable fear in the policed, the surveyed communities, right? And uh, I think history is actually very important here. I mean, a lot of us have a common interest in history. And you know, work that I'm uh, doing with policing and the RCMP and Indigenous uh, people, that Kent Monkman painting, uh, which shows an RCMP officer grabbing an Indigenous uh, child to take uh, the child off to residential schools, that, that's still very real uh, for a lot of people. So I think that um, history is one of the many disciplines uh, that uh, can contribute uh, to it. I think what's really interesting is, you know, trying to document both the over-policing, the over-surveillance, and the under-protection, but then to do the link. So to build the evidence around the vicious circle. And, uh, you know, again, I, you know, I go back after 9-11, uh, really the only American public intellectual uh, that really cared uh, about equality uh, was Ronald Dworkin. And everyone was talking about rebalancing, you know, uh, uh, liberty versus security. And uh, the late Ro uh, Ronald Dworkin, I think to his everlasting credit, said, no, 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 we also have to look at equality. Right, uh, because it isn't whose li you know it's whose liberty are you trading for whose security? So that's that's one theoretical attempt to uh, think about this vicious circle. But I would love to see the next generation of scholars uh, look for those uh, sorts of links and 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 to show connections between things that. Um, I think um, many of the public uh, see as disconnected. I mean, I don't think many people in the public have drawn a connection between Mayor Arar and what happened in Quebec City. And I think, 
you know, just to go back, Islamophobia, I mean, my working definition, and it's a very unsophisticated, and I, I wouldn't be surprised many people disagreed with me, is kind of systemic discrimination. And that's just because that's, that's what I know as a criminal justice scholar. But what I like about the Islamic phobia the, is the phobia. Because I think that a lot of our discussions about systemic discrimination, say with respect to indigenous uh, people, uh, do not always confront the irrational fear that many settlers have of indigenous people. They have a fear of indigenous people as parents. Uh, that explains the residential schools, but it also explains some uh, wrongful convictions of indigenous uh, parents uh, uh, in relation to the deaths of their children. And I think that uh, we have to uh, realize that discrimination results in fear however uh, you know, awful that is, and ever, however invidious. Uh, we have to deal with that uh, also on an emotional level, whether you're talking about police or intelligence agents or any of the apparatus. And, and we also have to think about uh, where we can have community groups uh, participate in the enterprise of community safety and even to work alongside uh, 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 people, uh, uh, police and security intelligence agencies. So the, you know, the book excerpt in the Globe today uh, by the Axesis agent, I, I'm looking forward to reading her book. Uh, and I think that that's gonna be another kind of source uh, for this ongoing uh, research program. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Roach. And uh, that's uh, Huda Mukbil's uh, book that's just come out about her experiences working for CSIS as a black Muslim woman. Um, so much to think about, and I'm sure uh, people in the audience, both online and here, um, are already starting to formulate lots of questions for our panelists, so in a few minutes we will open it up for questions. Um, and that um, Islamophobia, of course, is touching all these essays, and that irrational fear, um, the fear and the stereotypes around Muslims. And I'm just actually going to quote from um, Professor uh, Said Adnan Hussein's essay because he actually pulled out um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission definition um, and then he also sort of juxtaposed it against uh, Professor Jasmine Zine, who many of us also know, around her definition. So I just, I'm going to just read it just, just for us to just kind of percolate on this because I know the definitions um, are often brought up as, you know, wh what do you mean by Islamophobia? And that can come across as the idea that we, for example, mm -hmm. are trying to um, quell discourse around critiques, legitimate critiques about Islam. And of course, when we go to the actual definitions, which um, this one in particular from the Ontario Human Rights Commission has been adopted by the federal government in its anti-racism strategy, and that is Islamophobia are stereotypes, bias, or acts of hostility towards individual Muslims or followers of Islam in general, and in, in addition to individual acts of intolerance and racial profiling, Islamophobia leads to viewing Muslims as a greater security threat on the institutional, systemic, and societal level. And then Professor Zian sort of uh, offered the following, quote, a fear and hatred of Islam and Muslim, and those perceived as Muslims, that translates into individual actions and ideological and systemic forms of oppression that support the logic and rationale of specific power relations. So again, just different ways of viewing th this issue that helps us to try to grapple with um, this, this potential solutions or how to address it. Um, and I think that that's a nice segue to uh, back to um, Dr. Hussain as an editor uh, of this volume and, and other volumes now as part of the series that you're looking at. Um, you know, just the depth, the depth that we're getting into just in, in this book and I'm sure in other uh, parts of the, the series. I'm wondering for you, um, how do you see this book be utilized um, to bring forward these types of complex conversations in the public discourse? That's a great question. And I'll say to a large extent, when it comes to how books like this translate to the public discourse, I defer to people like you who 
really know how to do that. And I think what this book provides to that end, um, it, it, it kind of differs based on different chapters. So just kind of looking at the three people uh, whose chapters are, you know, that we're hearing about today. Um, Dr. Roach's essay gives, I mean, paragraph by paragraph, um, research projects that graduate students out there could just pick a paragraph and you can go and study that. And what Professor Akande's uh, chapter gives us is, I think, and actually I wanted to add this based on the earlier conversation about evidence, um, is that, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a sociologist. And so for me, what you've written is evidence. So lived experiences, ethnography, qualitative study, all of these count as evidence for the sociologist. And I think is a, one of the maybe neatest segues to public discourse, where, which is so moved by storytelling. Um, and so what Professor Akande writes about is experiences that I think many people have. Right, and that's kind of, I, as on my reading, that's a big part of the point. Um, and then as for Dr. Iman's work, uh, we see a really, uh, really interesting engagement on the relationship between the public and private sectors. And I think, again, through storytelling and seeing Muslims uh, work as an empirical jumping point to understanding that larger relationship. So if, if we were to do that, then you know, the point is not only to speak about Islamophobia as this narrowly conceived thing, right? But to understand it across many sectors, to understand it in many different kinds of ways. So the way that the state works um, in a repressive fashion in a counterterrorism context, but also these other contexts. So that those are just some examples, but I think there are many more. No, thank you so much for that. So we're at a point where we can open it up for questions from the audience or reflections from anyone who's here, any of the authors who are here want to add to the discourse. Um, I, I see some authors in the room, those who may have questions. Um, I know, for, for instance, just what Dr. Hussain was talking about in terms of it being as a, as a jumping point. Um, when we used to advocate, or when I was sort of in the trenches advocating around Bill C-51, I remember how important it was to broaden the discourse around the impacts on civil liberties writ large, right? And constantly thinking about um, when we are specifically looking at different forms of oppression and discrimination in our society, the importance of tying it back to, you know, the whole society and how addressing these forms of discrimination are really about protecting our democratic rights and freedoms for all of us. So being able to make those connections I think are very important as we bring forward these research topics for pursual. So looking into the audience, and there is a floating mic going around. So I'll ask a question just to have people warm up to, uh, to take it. So uh, we've been talking about uh, evidence, uh, about uh, both um, quantitative, qualitative evidence. Um, I'm I wanted to ask a little bit about how we, and if we want to relate it to the larger context of democracy and multiculturalism. So if we wanted to assess uh, whether we are succeeding uh, in a multicultural society, we would want to see a diminishment or an eradication, uh, the elimination of uh, uh, systemic racism, of systemic Islamophobia and so on. And I think we have a, a sense uh, a little bit of uh, the problems, the negativity. How do we assess the positive side? You know, can we assess how uh, there are ways in which, and I'm thinking about this in the context that this book should be read by Statistics Canada, obviously, so that they could refine a little bit the way in which they're measuring everything under the sun but they, they may want to measure certainly the level of incidents that are occurring. Uh, but if we identify, how do we measure whether there are ways uh, that work 
to uh, combat uh, Islamophobia. Whether it, anybody has any thoughts on that? I mean, I think that we do, I mean, hate crime is obviously one indicator, but we know that, um, you know, probably only a minority of all crimes are reported to the police. So I think we need to, you know, work on victimization studies as well as police reported. But in terms of the response, I don't, you know, and, and, and this has been a long standing concern is um, I worry when everything gets channeled into the criminal process. And of course, we, we saw this uh, over the Quebec mosque, uh, because then it, it too often becomes a kind of zero sum uh, sort of contest. Um, and so uh, I think that we need to measure levels of social solidarity and social empathy and social concern about hate crimes. Because hate crimes uh, are a poison uh, to a democracy, they're a poison uh, to a multicultural democracy uh, like Canada. And I think we also need to look, I mean, again, I haven't made a study of this, but I have a general sense that what uh, Prime Minister Arden did after Christchurch was maybe quite important. Maybe not, right? Uh, but um, that kind of provides, uh, you know, unfortunately these are global uh, events, but that also provides uh, a way to do comparative studies, you know, and, and I'm pretty sure Amber was, was with us probably 10, 15 years ago when uh, we went to Singapore uh, to look at uh, uh, Singapore and Muslim minorities. And, and again, you know, I mean, a lot of people kind of say to me, why are you going to Singapore? Better not bring gum uh, or drugs. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's interesting to examine uh, comparatively a society where uh, the Muslim minority is about 15%. Just like I think Canada on indigenous issues can learn a lot from uh, the New Zealand because of uh, the Maori are about 15%. So I think that we can measure uh, from what societies uh, do uh, that maybe have a more sizable uh, population of whatever minority is being discriminated and think about what are they doing right and what are they they doing wrong but I but I you know I, I, I do wish stats Canada um, was you know, uh, I mean, I wish it had more resources, but I also wish that it entered into a better kind of conversation. Because when I was working on the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission and on the volume about the legacy of residential schools, we were so reliant on what Stats Canada collected and what Stats Canada didn't collect. So I actually think you're on the right track, that that's one of the institutions that we need to work with uh, uh, going forward. So, thank you. I just wanted to address that because, you know, for me, one of the things that I try not to do in most of my work is say that I'm addressing Islamophobia. Because uh, as a historian of Islamic law, we've oftentimes looked at Islamic law, for instance, as a thing that we have to look at. Um, or we have to look at this idea of Islamic orthodoxy as a thing that has to be looked at from some presumably objective vantage point, which has been the academic study of Islam and Islamic law. And I would be hesitant to do the same thing with Islamophobia. So for me, what I've chosen to do both in my work here, but also even in thinking about uh, the work done at the Institute was center the Muslimist trope as a standpoint from which to think about the larger society in which we're in. And it could be Muslim, it could be black, it could be indigenous. But when you center that, that identity, and then you begin to look at, well, how does this democratic society think with that group? Then it actually becomes an opportunity for diagnosis, not about the group, but out about the claims of democracy. So for instance, you know, Kent was talking about the vicious circle. 
Well, one of the things that that vicious circle allows when you center the Muslim or the black or the indigenous person is we're really not thinking about equality when we're thinking about freedom and security. That's the missing piece. And then, it's, then the questions become, well, as we're thinking about security, what mechanisms are we putting into place with respect to equality? If we're not putting that into place, that's a diagnostic opportunity. And that, I think, is a, has been, for me, a more fruitful way forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Roche, for providing at least a definition uh, that was missing for Islamophobia. You know, uh, it's lumped with anti-Semitism, but when you hate, discriminate, you are the actor. But when you are afraid, you are a victim. So it's a very big difference, OK? And, uh, and I, I had dealt with the, with the subject 35 years ago, in fact, in the next room. And Sadlmeyer had asked me to uh, present, and I gave a uh, presentation on comparative study of uh, Israel and Pakistan, which are two uh, very key players. But uh, I've been here 55 years, and I've had made many Christian friends. And uh, after a while, they begin to ask you, you know, pointed questions. You know, you know, and uh, and the dialogue goes something like this, you know. OK, I'm a Muslim, by the way, right? Oh, so, so you think that uh, you, you want to be like your prophet. I see how that, don't you? Uh, is it true that your prophet didn't know how to read and write? Well, I said, that's what Muslims believe. Is it true that he married a six-year-old girl? I said, that's what Muslims believe. What can I say? They said, OK, well, if a, somebody, a Muslim, moves into my neighborhood as a renter, and uh, his goal is to become an illiterate, illiterate pedophile child molester like his prophet, you know, do I need to fear for my six-year-old daughter when he's going to look at her as a, a ticket to heaven? I have no answer, you know. And uh, I believe that all of you have, uh, writers have told that you don't have any solutions, of course, because the solution is, does not lie with the victim. It lies with us, the Muslims. And I think the ball is really in our court, Muslim court, what to do about Islamophobia. It's not anti-Islam, it's not hated, it's Islamophobia, fear of Islam. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Hi. There's another uh, one. I don't know if I'm gonna. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna phrase this right, so just bear with me. Um, but do you think these like discriminatory policies uh, against Muslims and everything came about after 9/11, or historically? I don't know if you're gonna be able to answer this, but historically, do you think there's been a sort of like anti-Islam agenda like in the West from before? Because I do think that we have seen evidence of how like America especially has tended to side with secular governments over like Islamic governments in certain wars and stuff. So do you think it kind of happened after 9-11 or was it kind of a kind of like a thing before that as well? Do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, uh, thanks for that um, really great question. I'm sure Professor Wafasan can give, um, you know, a really long lecture <laughs> in response yeah. to, 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 yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, to that question. I'm just going to say um, really quickly that I'm actually um, thinking about that question really, um, in a piece that I'm um, just writing at the moment. And, and that um, piece was uh, spurred by the, the current um, UN debates that I referred to when I was speaking, um, in which um, you know, there's a consideration of a proposal um, about whether to extend um, um, the international legal protections um, concerning racial discrimination, specifically those, um, um, you know, um, within the, uh, the ICER, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, to cases of religious discrimination. Um, and what I'm doing, um, what that, you know, what that opportunity to engage with um, the UN body doing this work and um, you know, uh, spurred me to do as a legal historian, of course, is to think, well, you know, can I, m might I be able to historicize um, this moment? Um, and, and, you know, and what that work has entailed for me is to really, um, you know, get me to, get me to appreciate um, the ways in which um, what I call um, the colonial encounter, right, between, um, um, you know, Europe, or Euro America and its others, um, both its, its others at home, right? Aboriginal peoples within the Western Hemisphere, but also peoples abroad, 
was always simultaneous was always simultaneously excuse me racial as it was religious right so the racial other was always um, really the religious other um, and, and that's you know that's uh, almost common sense right so I mean because we talk about the civilizational distinction um, but there's still a need for actual academic work because in a sense it's still considered to be somewhat polemical right um, in those policy circles where these sorts of knowledge really matter um, and what I what I do um, right in this piece is to really take that seriously um, you know um, and to argue um, based on um, historical evidence um, you know much of it is a lot of what I do is 19th and 20th century legal history that's my um, forte but I um, also draw on secondary um, references from um, as far back as um, you know as, as far back as the Middle Ages and, and I argue that um, that indeed the colonial encounter was a simultaneously about racial and religious authoring um, in fact and that that, or that really matters in, t you know, for in terms of understanding um, the foundations of the international legal order, right? Um, you know, and it matters indeed for um, imagining what an effective international legal response might be. But if Professor Hassan wants to respond um, you know, further, that would be great, yeah. Sure. Um, we, just need to get the we just need to get the microphone to sure. uh, with that. Yeah. Well, just because it's for the online, online audience. I guess I, I, I appreciate your question, and I think I get that, that question a lot from students. Yeah. Um, and I want to uh, just say a lot of times students do kind of use sort of 9-11 as a kind of originary historical point, um, which is interesting. Uh, and I think a lot of settler colonial societies, which is the one that we exist in today, um, really rely on something that I would call like invests in and emphasizes resultant violence. And so um, we erase, you know, we erase the kind of originary violence of um, Islamophobia, Orientalism. And Edward Said has done you know, all this work of centuries of Islamophobic production, culturally, politically, economically, militarily. Um, and you know, other, other scholars, you know, from the, from the 17th century and onwards, and mm -hmm. this is kind of this campaign that's sort of subtle, it's, it's art, it's poetry, it's film. Um, and so it really is important, I mean, this particular point is important in to constantly contextualize the legacies that we've inherited as a kind of centuries long project um, when we are confronted with this temporal narrative that it's a response to 9-11. I mean, we know even in the 80s, and this is part of the part of my chapter, mm -hmm. um, that during the Gulf War, yeah. Ira Iraqi, you know, Iraqi people were being pulled out of work, <coughs> um, their families didn't know, and they were being interrogated about their position on the Gulf War. Um, this is much before, you know, long before 9/11. <laughs> um, and um, you know, for many of us who arrived, I arrived here in Canada as a refugee, um, as a humanitarian refugee. Um, after being displaced uh, for Palestine, being born in Kuwait, know knowing sort of the legacies of, um, you know, foreign policies that come out of um, imperial nations uh, that have affected us. So, so I think that's a really, you know, this is something that my students often really view as a historical beginning point. And it's really important to continue to kind of broaden out, yeah, a kind of urge. And you know, to do the same when we talk about indigenous communities and black communities, um, because often um, settler colonial and imperial societies, and I'm coming from, you know, epistemology studies and cultural studies, so we're all coming from different places here, I'm in women and gender studies, um, where we often, um, there it's actually a kind of strict discursive strategy to um, reflect on the ways that we need to kind of tame the racialized body as a kind of <laughs> regrettable violence. You know, we don't want to do this, but we have to because we need to tame the uncivilized body. Yeah. Okay, as the, uh, thank you so much for that, uh, oh, for that. Yeah. And we're gonna pass the mic towards the back and as it's going there, I also recommend um, one of the books that I came across years ago uh, is Islamic Peril by Professor Kareem H. Kareem from Carleton University. And so when I was in journalism school, um, I relied on that book um, because it helped to, you know, s situate the narratives around Muslims that had 
predated 9-11. And so it was very important to, to understand that it didn't, as, as Wafa just said, um, it didn't start there. Uh, so questions over, over here? Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for the book. Um, because we definitely always need evidence, especially when we're talking to like uh, in the across the academic community, we want to make sure that we're um, like con get conveying uh, what we experience using evidence. But my question is, and this is based on an observation, I've attended many uh, Islamophobic events and mostly uh, Muslims attend these events. Like around 90% of the attendees are always Muslims. And I feel like if we want to get this message um, beyond us, then we need to like find ways to promote more. And of course, what we're doing today is a great step. But I was I was wondering what w can we do to further uh, like spread this message or like share our experiences on a larger scale than like mainly being our Muslim community, like because this is something that I've noticed and I just, I feel like if we can cross this barrier, then I think it would help people understand. Mm -hmm. Well, it's your job, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I will certainly use any attention that comes to this office for helping to shine a spotlight on the incredible work like the essays in this book for sure and ensure that it reaches a wider audience. But I think if I may yeah. <laughs> segue, I think the responsibility falls on all of us in the different spaces that we are in. Um, I think the challenge from sort of a media perspective, if I can share that, is unfortunately, as many of us know, um, within the news, if it's bad news, that's what you'll see. And so, um, you know, I think that um, one of, a f maybe if for, the series for later on, or I don't know if there's a thought about this, but just how the public discourse and how people in positions of authority, how they speak about minority communities, including about Muslims, how that links to um, violence against our communities as well as the systemic or the entrenchment of the systemic Islamophobia that we have within our communities. So that's, I think, would be a really interesting area of research, um, simply from the advocate perspective, you know, over the years when we've seen uh, negative discourse about Muslims, for example, the niqab ban that was um, you know, part of an election, a federal election uh, that we had several years ago, um, we could almost map out um, the, the violence and the harassment that visibly Muslim women were experiencing during that election period, as well as the vandalism of various uh, political uh, campaign signs for parties that appeared to be sympathetic to supporting the human rights of uh, this minority within a minority community. So, um, you know, I think it's it's really important. And, and you know, there was a comment earlier by, uh, you know, someone from the audience um, suggesting that, um, you know, it's up to Muslims to, you know, explain their beliefs to society. Um, you know, but I think something that Professor a a a Iman told me earlier um, is that ha when we're talking about these issues, of course, we just go back to the charter, to section 15 around equality rights. Um, you know, we, we all hold different views on life and that's a great source of discussion. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about human rights and about our rights to participate fully and contribute positively to society, we all have equality rights. And, and so, you know, people's opinions, as, as interesting and fascinating they are, as they are, um, you know, it's, that's not what this is about. This is about preserving and promoting and protecting the human rights of all of us to participate in this democratic project. Um, and I really appreciate the comment earlier about um, a book like this um, helping to really um, demonstrate where uh, the claims of democracy that people will hold on to, where they are weaker. Uh, than, than maybe is being expressed by, by the state. And so um, if we are all sincere in wanting to see a strong democracy where all communities can flourish for the benefit of all, then I think we need to um, figure out ways to strengthen those weak points. Um, and of course, as you said, diagnose them to begin with and then work to together and collaboratively to strengthen um, a, d a democracy that, that works for all of us. Yeah. Any other questions? I yeah. F yeah. Professor Baba, Faisal Baba, one of the authors in the uh, in the collection. So the microphone's coming forward. Oh, was there one before? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yes, and then we'll come to. Yes, please. Um, hi, everyone. 
Uh, thank you so much for the, for the book. Um, I can't wait to read it. Um, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at University of Toronto. Um, and I study also Islamophobia. Um, and I, I um, recognize that a lot of the time when we're talking about Islamophobia, we're talking about the protection of minority rights in a democratic context. And a lot of the time we're talking about the Canadian Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. Um, but I think we have seen some of the limits of um, the charter and you know, within the charter itself, the, for example, the notwithstanding clause and section 33 and how um, invoking that clause can actually um, limits, limit the rights um, that we you know, take for granted. Um, so I wanted to ask about, are there art alternatives um, to sort of relying on the Canadian Charter? Are there other frameworks that we could sort of rely on to um, start to dismantle Islamophobia? Like whether it be, um, you know, like maybe Islamic frameworks or um, indigenous frameworks or just um, not having all of our efforts and energies always directed towards upholding, you know, the liber liberal democratic settler state, colonial state. Um, so that's just my... Go ahead. Sure. Well, um, so I, I think that's a fair question. And of course, part of the problem is you have three law professors up here, which is perhaps my, my, an error on my part in terms of diversifying disciplines. Um, but I want to suggest, you know, I'd like to, if I may, make a plug. Uh, if I, uh, so I've been really very interested in storytelling. Like how do we tell stories? And so, you know, Faisal Baba, who's also here, um, who's not just an author, but has been a real uh, important supporter of an initiative uh, called the Muslims in Canada Archives Project. And that's a project designed, actually supported through your ministry, through the Ministry of Heritage. Um, and that's about collecting the records of the contributions Muslims have made to Canadian heritage so that you and others can come and tell stories, or if not us, then our children or their kids. And so for me, I think it's about how do we, how do we capture the stories that we can tell and use that storytelling to re-narrate what it means to talk about Islam. And, and I'll just give you an example is that, you know, when, when you look at some of the national security literature that looks at, for instance, in the context of charities and terrorism financing, it's almost the same tropes. You know, Muslims, jihad, zakat, waqf, right? These are the same, these are these, these, these terms from Islamic law and legal history. But that, that presumes that Muslims are reducible to medieval texts. And so if we, s you know, part of the challenge then is using an archive to shift the text. We're not just looking at medieval fic, we're looking at letters, we're looking at comic strips, we're looking at whatever it is that Muslims have produced over time, we're expanding the literary corpus. And so, you know, as we begin to, to, uh, to enter your homes right now, um, our archivists are working with, with, uh, with, with some of you right here, about collecting those kinds of documents that allow us to tell multiple different and not so easily reducible stories. And that would be one of my strategies. Okay, back to uh, you, Professor Baba. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, m many people believe that the way to combat systemic uh, discrimination is to change the system, and that one way of changing the system is to change the composition uh, the identity of the system. Um, so when the government changed in 2015, these kinds of conversations about state-sponsored Islamophobia, um, maybe some people naively thought they would end. Uh, I think realistically we knew they would change. Um, a lot of the things that we're talking about today are processes that were set in place before the Harper Conservatives. I mean, this the conversation about n whether 9-11 was a trigger. And we've seen it basically exist regardless of partisan politics, regardless of who's in power, these, uh, these social phenomena, ph political phenomena have existed. And I think the thing that this collection shows us and that recent developments, including the piece in Today's Globe by uh, Huda Mukbil, is that even with EDI, if EDI, I'll use that as short form for signaling the, the compos compositional change, even with that, it doesn't actually change the systemic problems. My, my chapter is, is about a, a case study uh, of systemic Islamophobia where the key decision makers are Muslims. Um, Muslims who occupy positions of power where the fact that they're Muslim either uh, is neutral 
or might even uh, contribute to them doing the wrong thing. Uh, we've seen in the States, Black Lives Matter came after the Obama presidency. Um, so, you know, we've and, and, and we heard about sunny the promises of sunny ways in 2015, and we haven't yet seen the full sunshine. So what does it mean? Like, what is the, f is EDI part of the solution? I know you're not promising to offer solutions, but I mean, like, EDI is not going to deliver us from evil, but is it even, is it part of the solution, or is it actually part of the problem? Do we sit back when we see Muslims in power and think, ah, oh, yeah, okay, we're good, we're good. We've had Muslim presidents of universities uh, and, and <laughs> politicians, and yet we see systemic Islamophobia. Um, maybe that's, I, maybe this is a provocation more than a question. Uh, thank you for, for anyone willing to take it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, pr so <laughs> Professor Kande, has accepted your provocation, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Baba. And yeah, he does this all the time, by the way. Um, so like my colleagues at Osgood Hall School. Um, so, the challenge with um, EDI is with patting ourselves on the back and thinking that once we've done that, then we're good to go and everything will be great. And we know, I mean, history has taught us that, um, you know, these you know institutions, these discriminatory institutions, these practices, these ideas, these ideologies take on a life of their own, right? Um, and that they survive, they live on, um, you know, far beyond, right, um, the original uh, proponents. And, and of course, the, the tragedy is that, um, you know, it's not uncommon that members of those minority groups or even internal minority groups um, might actually be um, the ones to, you know, to effectuate, um, to actually give a life to, to those um, ideas and policies. And so, you know, EGA is not part of the problem. Um, the problem is, we thinking and we you know we deceiving ourselves, um, you know, as you know, scholars, as policymakers, as activists, that once um, the face changes, then um, the underlying um, ideologies, um, you know, have changed, and, and we know that that's just not um, how it works. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I see a connection here between your point and the question from the postdoc right before this. That um, I think if we look at the history of EDI, we very much go to the United States. And what we see happening there is now a, you know, for, for decades EDI was encouraged um, very much as a way to make a space for minorities within a system in order to preserve a system. It has sold itself at times as more than that, but it kind of has, has also told us what it is, and that is what it is. So if that's the case, then, you know, I think what you find in your chapter is additional evidence using the case of Muslims that EDI is doing what it is designed to do. And what we see in the US that I think, you know, is an important provocation related to both of your questions is a move against EDI from the right that is, um, I think, maybe a provocation that the rest of us should accept that can we do something that is not EDI? That can we get beyond that? Can we do something greater and better than that rather than constantly having to negotiate with EDI and its limits? And if we try to do that, what does it look like? So a plug for the series, these are the kinds of questions that we wanna ask, you know? Can we do something different and could it be incredible? So we're just about at time, and I think if, uh, if I just may ask a final kind of question to allow um, our panel to sort of provide some concluding thoughts. Um, the question really is, what's at stake? What's at stake um, for our communities, the broader public, if we don't try to address these issues and at some level? So maybe I'll move from Dr. Hussain onward back to this direction. Oh, I mean, the, the stakes are, are massive. Um, I think what many of these essays point out is that Muslims are everywhere, <laughs> in every community, in every sector, at every level, in every geography. So that means any given issue is implicated. So I, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, uh, I agree, the, the, the stakes are huge. It's, it's obviously democracy. Uh, equality, but but also 
the effectiveness of our society. I mean, um, you know, the ability to protect people from hate crimes and mass violence. I think that's something that, uh, you know, we need to do and we need to insist that, you know, every crime victim matters and that that's important and that we may not necessarily, you know, by, by defending the traditional criminal sanction, it's a little bit like defending EDI, we have to at least ask ourselves the question, is it worth defending this or should we change and ask for something better? So. Um, I would say that um, what is at stake is what um, Dr. Hussein and um, Professor Rocha have mentioned, so, you know, um, equality, um, democracy, um, but I would also um, add something that comes up often um, in my classes um, and that I often hear my students say, and that's the question of legitimacy, right? So how is this legitimate? Um, you know, um, how, you know, is this, if it's not legitimate, is it, is it sustainable, right? And so that question of the legitimacy of, you know, of our legal system, of our political system of the state um, is one that I hear often from my students. Um, for me, I find that what's at stake is putting a face to who pays the trade-off costs. Oftentimes when we talk about freedom and national security, we say, well, there's always a trade-off. My concern has been that when we talk about it in these sort of law and economic terms, we erase the reality of who pays the trade-off. And my, my concern, and you can see it in every single one of these essays, every single one of these essays is about putting a face to the person that pays the trade-off. And the sad thing is, is they're always similar looking faces. Uh, and that, I think, is a real problem if we take um, equality seriously. So that, that's my hope. Of, what's, of what we can pursue, and hopefully what's at stake if we don't. All right, well thank you so much to the panel. I just wanna take this moment to thank our audience, those who are online, and of course those who made it out to Massey College. Um, I hope you get a chance to delve deeply into this book. There's so much to think about, just as you've gotten a bit of a taste this, this afternoon, and I'll pass it back to Nathalie for final words. I want to thank you, and thank putting this idea together and uh, we want to celebrate books, uh, great books, and I want to thank uh, Mira for uh, leading this fascinating uh, conversation. I think I've learned a lot. Uh, I want to continue to not only read the book but think a, lo a lot about the many of the issues that were raised today. We call this series Massey Loves to Read, but I think now some people have said it also means Massey loves to buy books, you know? <laughs> uh, which is also the invitation of all of you to continue to support our authors and the, the endeavor. If you cannot buy the book, continue to read it, recommend it, and, and also let's engage uh, in the uh, deeper reflections uh, about expanding the network of people that care uh, about these issues. Merci beaucoup.